at the cross, we see the great cost of our sin on Christ. Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. This is a newer song. We've sung it a few times as a congregation, but we'll sing all three verses of his mercy is more. scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 21. It's a praise psalm for the king. And as you read through, I think most of us will read through and go, I have never heard of a king like this one. It's because there's never been a king quite like this one until Christ. And so we can reflect on our king, Jesus, and his goodness to us as we read through Psalm 21 together. I'll ask you to read where uh, the screens say congregation, and I will read where it says leader. Let's begin in verse 1. O Lord, in your strength the king will be glad, and in your salvation how greatly he will rejoice. You have given him his heart's desire, and you have not withheld the request of his lips. Salah. For you meet him with the blessings of good things. You set a crown of fine gold upon his head. He asked life of you. You gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your salvation. Splendor and majesty you place upon him. For you make him most blessed forever. You make him joyful with gladness in your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord. And through the loving kindness of the Most High, he will not be shaken. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire will devour them. 
Their offspring you will destroy from the earth and their descendants from among the sons of men. Though they intend evil against you and devised a plot, they will not succeed. For you will make them turn their back and you will aim with your bowstrings at their faces. We have a fire alarm going off. Let's finish reading together the last verse of the psalm. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. Well, that was exciting. Uh, we didn't plan it that way, obviously, but Steve Twiddell did. Um, he confessed on the breezeway uh, that he wanted his donut early. Uh, <laughs> So he pulled the fire alarm, and well, there we go. So halftime is over, and we are going to resume our service uh, right where we left off. Uh, let's do thank uh, those that every week take care of donuts and fellowship, and then they, they quickly saw the need and got everything out for us. Uh, so we're just going to gonna. Start skip right at the very end of the service, go right to Sunday school. I don't know if there's enough donuts to get another one on the way. Uh, no, we're, we're all out, but let's thank them for all of their work. That's great. Also, just another reminder uh, that we're grateful for our security team. Uh, they quickly discerned uh, what we needed to do. They were at all the doors as they were trained to and helping us get out. Um, and so thank you, Jeff, Mom, and Randy, and others for all of your work to be prepared uh, for an occasion just like that. So at this time, the Children's Church has already started, but if you were planning on participating, if you're three years old through sixth grade, uh, you can go over to the Bradford Chapel, and then you can pick up your children either after this service or after Sunday school near the Bradford Chapel. We are going to sing one more hymn. We'll sing Like a River Glorious. It speaks about the peace that transcends understanding because we are in the Lord's hands. We'll sing all three verses. Let's stand together.
We'll ask the ushers to prepare to receive the offering. Notice that some visitors came in kind of while we were outside. We want to welcome you, and uh, we're glad that you chose to visit with us today. There are visitor cards that are in the back of the pew in front of you. If you would be kind enough to fill out one of those cards and either put in the offering plate, probably can't do it that fast, um, or in the offering box in the atrium, or just hand it to uh, one of our pastors or to the ushers, we would love to follow up on your visit. There's also a QR code on there that you could use to uh, fill out that online, but we, we just want to have the opportunity to build a relationship with you. Um, the scripture says that God loves a cheerful giver. We'll ask the ushers to go ahead and come forward now. Um, I, most of the time when we talk about that verse, we kind of zero in on cheerful giver. Uh, but over the last few weeks, my heart has been drawn to the word love. God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, there is something in the heart of God when we as Christians um, make a choice to obey his word and give, and to consider his work um, a valuable treasure to us by giving. And God loves that, and so we give uh, out of great joy. At the end of the service today, um, we have, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper, and we have a business meeting. Um, and then we will dismiss straight to our Sunday school classes uh, when we dismiss at the very end. A quick thank you to our deaconesses uh, for all of their work facilitating the brunch last week, and also uh, for being very flexible pertaining to the Lord's Supper. Uh, just thankful for their servant's heart. Thank you to David and Scott last week for jumping in really at the last minute. Um, Randy got sick at the last minute. I was out of town. I was emailing Scott and David early, early uh, Sunday morning, and they just jumped in and ran everything, and so thankful for uh, their commitment to our church family. VBS begins tomorrow. If you have children that are participating in VBS, registration is at 845 in the lobby of the Bradford Chapel, and VBS will begin at 9 o'clock. Um, just to encourage you parents uh, that we our VBS is not an all day all night camp um, and so you will need to come back and pick up your children um, 1130 is a great time and you can pick them up right where you drop them off at the Bradford Chapel lobby uh, we do have a workers meeting today all VBS workers should meet in the Bradford Chapel at 1210 and we have promised that that meeting will be no more than 30 minutes so you can get to a lunch. We could use some last minute help uh, this evening from six o'clock to seven o'clock um, just with some final things that need to be set up that we really can't do until we get all of our registrations in. We still have folks registering right now and also we clear out for the day. And so if you would be willing to help, here's the deal. Um, my cell phone number would you text me and let me know that you're planning on coming, or you can email. Uh, we don't need help for more than an hour, just that one hour. And then anybody who comes to help, I probably shouldn't announce this over the live stream, uh, we'll get ice cream afterwards. Um, and we would, we would love that fellowship um, after we help out today. Men's night is next Sunday night. And uh, again, the purpose of this is simply fellowship, uh, men to men. We need this. We need to know each other. We need to pray together. We need to encourage each other. And so the sign-up sheet is in the atrium today. The cost for that is $3, and then you need to bring a snack, either a salty sack or a, a sweet snack. You know, people always ask, what do you mean by salt, uh, salty or sweet? I mean, are we supposed to bring desserts? Are we supposed that's the beauty of it. If you consider it to be salty, bring it. If you consider it to bring sweet, be sweet, bring it. Um, and that'll be, that'll be next Sunday night. And then just encourage you to sign up today and bring somebody with you. Missions Conference really begins next Sunday. Um, it has been a joy to have uh, Don and Terry Hall back with us during the spring. And we haven't yet given them an opportunity to report on the work that they did over two years in Zambia at CABU. And so next Sunday morning, 
Uh, Don is going to preach, and then we're going to have a combined Sunday school uh, to for them to give a report on their two years of ministry, and, and maybe kind of give us some hints as to what's next. Uh, we'll take more time to talk about that at another date, but really the heart is just to hear them um, give us an update on, on their ministry there. Then, Missions Conference begins uh, in total with all of our missionaries here the next Sunday, and so that is uh, the 23rd of July. In your bulletin, you have all the information, schedule, all the participants, um, and, uh, you know, kind of baseline, when you invite guests over to your home, it's important that you're there. <laughs> and when you support missionaries, when we as a church support missionaries, and we invite them, uh, in some cases, to fly, you know, hundreds and thousands of miles to be with us, it's important that we're here. Beyond that, we need our hearts to be stoked pertaining to the Great Commission. We can learn from our missionaries how to be more faithful here and how to be better partners for them. And so I hope that everybody in our church family will commit to being as present as you possibly can during missions conference. There's a handful of signups that are in the atrium today. Uh, first sign up is for our Saturday evening dinner, um, and I think that there's actually tickets for that. The cost is in the bulletin. Most important thing is we want everybody to come. So if you if you can't afford, afford the full cost of the tickets, just let them know. But we want everybody to come, and then we pray after that on Saturday night. Uh, then there's two other missions conference signups that are available in the atrium. On Monday and Tuesday, we have lunch with our missionaries um, in the Madison room. And so pastors are there, staff's there, uh, our missionaries missionaries are there. Sometimes some of our folks from our missions uh, committee are able to come, but that's open to everybody in the church, and there's no cost for that for you. You just have to sign up so we know that you're coming. Brandy Hurling uh, takes care of the food for all of that. It's just a great time to have extra fellowship with our missionaries. And then also in the atrium, there's a board uh, right as you leave the auditorium. Uh, that has all of the meal signups for Missions Conference. There's quite a few slots to fill, and those are great opportunities to kind of go one-on-one -on -one with our missionaries and to hear their heart for what God um, has called them to do. A couple more quick announcements. Uh, Hunter Hansen is on our uh, missions committee, and he is overseeing transportation, so connecting some of our missionaries that need cars while they're here. And uh, he promised that if you have a car that they could use for the few days that you're here, if you talk to him, he promises to give in return a driving-related joke. Um, um, so, I mean, I would be interested in doing that just to hear Hunter's joke. Um, but if you have a vehicle, I think we need two uh, that, that you could help with. We do have missionary letters today, and so let's uh, get these out very quickly. Uh, C-A-B-U, uh, this goes to Phil Hunt. And of course, now is a great time to uh, write to Phil. We've been praying for him with their land dispute issue. Um, and um, so we want to be an encouragement to him. Uh, also, they are in the process of building that publishing building for the publishing company and also library. And so uh, now's a great time. Christy Colas was just with us. Um, she told us while she was here that she was transitioning um, from uh, one kind of focused church to another one and uh, you can encourage her in prayer. And then also, Joel and Shelly, they minister in Western Asia. We don't announce specifically where they are. We don't support them financially, but we have remained their partners through prayer. And uh, actually went to college with Joel. Uh, Joel is very faithful. Uh, all, I've known him for uh, 25 years or so now, and uh, just a faithful, faithful servant. So very good. Let's go ahead and pray together. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for an opportunity to gather together as a church family. We feel increasingly, day by day, that we are pilgrims and strangers in this land. Uh, our hearts, our eyes are set on heaven, and we long for the day when Christ returns and we are able to be with you. Um, until then, you have called us to be obedient to your word uh, to stand out by our faithfulness and how that makes us different in our culture. You have called us to be bold witnesses to those who don't know you. And we ask that you would uh, give us grace uh, to do all of those things well. Thank you for kind of a, a slice of heaven every Sunday where we get to gather with other pilgrims 
and encourage each other, sometimes challenge one another to love and good deeds. I pray that we would be faithful um, uh, Christians in our engagement with one another even today. We do pray for our missionaries. Thank you for CABU, and uh, we uh, just watch with delight as you continue to prosper uh, that ministry as they seek to be faithful to your word and uh, raise up a, a generation of national leaders for the church and really all of Africa. And well, we do pray for this uh, land dispute issue. Um, it would seem like uh, there's some unjust efforts that are taking place trying to take advantage of CABU. I pray that you would give Phil and the board and uh, the administration of the school great wisdom as they engage the city and even this neighbor that seems to have bad intentions, I pray that um, they would know how to walk that fine line of speaking the truth and love. And Lord, I pray ultimately that through their witness, he would uh, come to faith in Christ. Lord, we pray for Christy. Thank you for her um, just joy in your work. Uh, we are eager to see how in this transition to another church that you direct her and then uh, how you open up new doors of opportunity. We know that she will faithfully steward uh, those opportunities. And then we pray for Joel and Shelley. Um, Lord, we are, are thankful for now over many years the um, way that they have uh, immersed themselves in the culture, built relationships, um, now have opportunities to do Bible studies. And Lord, I pray that through these Bible studies that those that they're engaging will come to faith in Christ. We pray for this specific request that you would direct them to a new place for their church plant to meet um, in this next year. Lord, we pray for our upcoming conference. Um, Lord, we don't, we don't put this on the schedule simply because it's a tradition, and that's the way we've always done it. Uh, but we, we want to be more faithful as partners to our missionaries, which means we need to know them and we need to know their work. And uh, we need to listen carefully for how they ask us to pray. And, and we need to learn from their example. And so I pray that uh, we would just have a blessed conference here in a few weeks. We pray for our missionaries as they make final preparations to travel and, and to give their reports and preach that uh, they know just how to engage us. Lord, we feel the very same way about VBS. We um, are not trying to keep up with other churches. We are um, not doing a vacation Bible school just because that's normal for a Baptist church, but because we really want to engage um, unbelieving families, kids that have maybe never heard the gospel before in our community and uh, our neighbors. And so, Lord, I pray that you would uh, bring children in uh, this week, that you'd give our teachers grace as they teach to be clear. And I pray for our own children that have come to faith in Christ already, that they would be strengthened in their faith as they're definitely in a culture that's targeting children and would like nothing more than to uh, ruin their faith. Lord, we pray for David as he preaches today. I pray that um, his mind would be clear with all of the distractions this morning and that your word would speak to us and we would respond to it in obedience. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Anna and Mary Beth and Rachel and Sarah for ministering to us and directing us to the source of God's Word, the Bible. Funny story, a couple of years ago uh, there was a funeral and the person was uh, knew the Irvins and so Sarah couldn't make it to the funeral, my wife, but uh, Anna and Mary Beth uh, ministered music and I was able to help out too. And so we were sitting on the front row and afterwards, someone who didn't know us came up to us and thanked us for serving and then said, your daughters are really talented at music. I said, thank you. They're actually my sister's-in-law, but uh, we appreciate that. Would you turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 26. We're going to be looking at verses 36 through 41 this morning. Matthew 26, 36 through 41. If you're using the Bible that's in the back of the pew in front of you, we're going to be on page 23 in the back section, the New Testament section, Matthew 26, 36 through 41. Have you ever thought about the significance of last words or near-to-death words? I think we uh, consider them significant because toward the end of life, people's priorities seem to be made clear. What do people choose to say or what do people choose to do near the end of life? Nathan Hale, a spy in our American War for Independence, who's executed by the British, some of his last words were, I regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. Todd Beamer, he was a passenger on Flight 93 on September 11th, uh, where they overpowered the hijackers. He said, are you guys ready? Let's roll. Some last words are profound in how sober they are. Here's some of Socrates' last words. Quote, all of the wisdom of this world is but a tiny raft upon which we must set sail when we leave this earth. If only there was a firmer foundation upon which to sail, perhaps some divine word. Some uh, believers often acknowledge their Savior in their last moments. Uh, One of my favorite quotes is from David Brainerd. He was a missionary to Native Americans. He said, quote, I am going into eternity, and it is sweet to me to think of eternity. The endlessness of it makes it sweet. But, oh, what shall I say of the future of the wicked? The thought is too dreadful, end quote. What one prioritizes near the end of life Uh, reveals what is important to him. And this morning we're going to look at Jesus' last night here on earth before the cross and what he chose to do and say in the Garden of Gethsemane, his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Let's read the passage together this morning, Matthew 26, 36 through 41. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he told his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. Verse 39, And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying so that you do not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I'd like to take a look at four observations from our text this morning. Full disclosure, I did give a brief devotional on this text a few months ago in our church family uh, prayer meeting on a Sunday evening, but Pastor Jason asked me to unpack it more in a sermon in a Sunday morning gathering. Uh, So that could mean one of two things. It could be a gentle way of saying, let's try that again. Let's try that again. Or it could mean that Pastor Jason is burdened for this passage to be brought before the congregation in a little longer format. Um, So probably a little bit of both. But we'll look at our passage at four observations. This is not a definitive treatise on prayer. 
This is just four things that uh, were convicting to me as I studied the text and wanted to share with you those. The first of these is the priority of prayer, the priority of prayer. Christ's first priority before his crucifixion was to pray. If you were facing certain torture and excruciating death and the impending wrath of God on you for the sins of those who would believe, what would you do? What what did Christ choose to do in the Garden of Gethsemane? Well, he prayed. Look at verse 36. Jesus came to the, with them to a place called Gethsemane, told his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. We see from this passage that he chose to pray first. He didn't consult others. He didn't run away or spend time worrying. He booked it to the garden so that he could pray. But it wasn't only at the end of Christ's life that he prioritized prayer. All the Gospels recount many times where Christ prioritized praying with his other disciples, where he carved out time to pray alone. It means that Christ, who had the power to heal, power to raise people from the dead, he prioritized prayer. It wasn't of secondary importance to him, which means that when he chose to pray, he was necessarily choosing not to do other things, other good things. It was in a garden, the Garden of Eden, that the first Adam was presented with the will of God for him to obey. Do not eat this fruit. And Adam chose to disobey. And now we find ourselves in another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, where the second Adam is presented with God's will for him to obey, not about refraining from eating fruit, but about drinking the very cup of God's wrath down to its very dregs. And the result for this second Adam wasn't continued uh, fellowship with God and paradise. It was suffering. It was death. It was excruciating but it brought life and forgiveness to those who would believe. He took our sin and God's wrath. What a weight. Do you know the word Gethsemane means olive oil press? I think that's a fitting name for this place of agonizing for Christ. Our sin, the weight of our sin, the weight of his Father's wrath, pressing in, crushing him. No wonder he said in verse 38, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. So in light of all that, what did Christ choose to do? He prayed. With the priests and soldiers already on their way, Christ chose to pray. He already knew what was going to happen in the next few hours. He chose to pray. We also see that Christ's prayer was unhurried, unhurried. Hurried. We, how often are our prayers, even about weighty matters, rushed or cut short or trimmed down to make room for what's really important? I remember when I was a kid, probably around seven or eight years old, um, my family had a habit of gathering in the living room to pray. We all sit around the living room and each one would take a turn praying. And sometimes someone would say in his or her prayer, now I just want to give some time for everyone to confess his or her sins that he committed throughout the day, and then there'd be a time of silence so that we could confess our sins. Well, in my young brain, I reasoned that God knows everything. And because he knows everything, he knew all of my sins from that day. So wouldn't it be more efficient, instead of taking the time to think through it, to just say, God, would you forgive all of my sins from today and move on? but I didn't want my family to catch on. So when it came time for me to pray, if no one had offered the time to confess before, I would do that. I would say, now let's, let's all confess our sins before the Lord. And I would say, God, forgive me for all my sins from today. And then I would count to 20 so that my family had enough time to confess their sins before God and that they wouldn't remove that blessing from them. Do you see how this kind of illustrates that we shouldn't uh, make prayer more efficient. 
We shouldn't shorten down our prayers as brief as possible. I want to be clear, there's no threshold of righteousness in prayer. If you pray for 14 minutes, it's not righteous. 15 minutes, now you're talking. That's, that's not how it works. But we shouldn't have the attitude that we have to pray, check it off our list, and then we get about the work of the kingdom. The work of the kingdom includes our prayer. In fact, prayer is one of the most important works of the kingdom. Christ's prayer was unhurried, but it was also about God's will. In this final prayer, we see Christ's priorities. And what did he choose to pray about? He prayed about his Father's will. We often, rightly so, we pray for safety. We pray for strength, maybe lesser suffering. We should do this. Christ's prayer, though, was in light of certain impending suffering. And what did he choose to pray about? He chose to pray about his Father's will. Essentially, this prayer is a holy wrestling match of wills. Christ's pure, righteous, good, holy will that sin not be, not be laid on him and defile his person. And Christ and God's, God the Father's will that Christ submit to this suffering for the salvation of those who would believe. He was agonizing, wrestling with God's will. I think we often avoid praying about God's will. We may tack it on to the end of a request, if it be your will. But do we actually treat it as the subject of our prayers? Do we wrestle with it in a godly way? We should imitate Christ by taking what we know to be God's will in Scripture to Him and wrestling with it. Not not in a sinful way, but with Him. God, I know you want me to defeat this besetting sin. I know it. It's in your word. It's your will. It's so hard. I have these desires. Help me. God, I know you want me to share the gospel with this coworker or this neighbor. I know you do. Would you help me to follow your will? The subject of our prayers should include God's will. God's will is not taboo for believers. It's not that our prayers are too audacious if we pray about it. We're not stepping on God's toes. We should pray about big things. God's will. Now we come to the second observation about Christ's prayer. That's the fellowship of prayer. The fellowship of prayer. Verses 37 to 38. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. The fellowship of prayer is first with God. Who did Jesus run to in the garden? He went directly to his Father in prayer. Now, God the Father, Jesus the Son, are one. John 10, 30. I and the Father are one. So, why pray? Well, while he was on earth, there must be a deeper fellowship in prayer than just the reality of his union with his Father. We are also united with God. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. So why should we pray to have fellowship with God? Maybe think about it this way. Prayer is like breathing. We exist in an environment where there is oxygen. That is the reality of our, of the, our environment. But we don't take part in that oxygen until we fill up our lungs through the act of breathing. We are positionally in union with our Lord through Christ's work on the cross, but we partake of that union when we fill our spiritual lungs with the oxygen of that fellowship through the process of breathing, of prayer. And we can look to Christ as our best model of this when he was on earth. He was constantly breathing the spiritual oxygen, spiritual fellowship with his Father. Prayer is the actualization of the reality of our fellowship with God. We also see prayer as fellowship with others. Prayer is fellowship with others. I don't know if we realize how bizarre this is. Christ wanted to pray 
with other humans. Imagine that. He's in turmoil. He's grieved in distress, verse 37. Verse 38, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. Think of the people he was with. Peter, he chose Peter to come with him. Peter had just bragged that he wouldn't let anything happen to Christ. He would die before letting anything happen to Christ. James and John, they had just argued about who would sit on the right hand and the left hand side of Christ in the kingdom. These are not pillars of spiritual maturity that he's dealing with here. But he chose to pray with them. He wanted to be near them in his trial. He wanted to keep watch with them. Corporate prayer, praying with other believers, is the lifeblood of a church. It's how we keep watch with each other. That's our calling as a church. We are called to keep watch with one another. Can I encourage you to take advantage of our bi-weekly uh, family, church family prayer meetings on Sunday nights. Um, promise that they won't go long enough that you'll fall asleep like the disciples did in Jesus' prayer meeting. Um, but they are such a time of encouragement. Essentially, we are saying to each other in the family prayer meeting, keep watch with me. Remain here. Keep watch with me. Our Sunday evening prayer meetings are not Sunday morning services, but just in a smaller format. They're very different because they are the fuel through which our Sunday morning gatherings and our mission of the church is successful. Third observation under fellowship is we see that prayer is fellowship with Christ. So now it's flipped. Fellowship with Christ. The disciples are called to fellowship with Christ in prayer to keep watch with Him, to face the battle with Him. Prayer is battlefield fellowship with Christ. Have you ever thought about prayer like that? Christ desired His disciples to watch with Him. Essentially, Christ is asking for a fellowship that's deeper than just being close in proximity. He's asking for his disciples to be with him in purpose, to watch out for the very same things, to commune with him in his time of distress, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Prayer is the battlefield fellowship with our Lord. I know many of us have one or two people in our lives that we would consider as prayer warriors. We live our lives more confidently knowing that they are praying for us. Well, guess what? Christ is your prayer warrior. And you get to pray alongside him. When we engage in prayer, we're actively on the battlefield with Christ. We are guarding against the forces of evil with Christ. We enter the throne room through the blood of Christ and participate in prayer in the throne room, and we find Christ there praying for us. Hebrews 7.25, Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Romans 8.34, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. This changes everything. This quote from Robert Murray Mishayan, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet distance makes no difference. He is praying for me, end quote. And we get to pray with him. Third point from our passage this morning is that Christ's prayer was for his own godly good desires, but he ultimately embrace the Father's will, even though that involved his unimaginable suffering. We see the surrender of prayer. The surrender of prayer. He went a little beyond them. He fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. This verse we see his prayer was fervent. 
It says he fell on his face and prayed. A few months ago, Dave Kaler gave a great devotion at one of our church family prayer meetings, and I'm sure he gave a lot of great points. I don't really remember all of them except for one, the fervency of prayer, the fervency of prayer. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you sometimes find it awkward to show emotion. Maybe others will find it distracting. Maybe it'll be fake. Maybe it'll be inauthentic performance. Maybe I'll trust in the fervency of my prayer instead of the God whom I'm praying to. These are all legitimate things to think through. However, let us also think through our numerous scriptural examples of fervent prayer. Of course, the Psalms are full of examples of fervent prayer. For example, Psalm 6, David cries out, I am weary with my moanings. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Fervent prayer. Daniel prayed a very fervent prayer in Daniel 9 for his people and repentance of sin. Hezekiah cried out to God twice in 2 Kings, once for deliverance from the Assyrians and once for deliverance from death for himself. Cried out to him. You know, Hannah prayed so fervently in 1 Samuel 1 that Eli thought that she was drunk. She was so fervent. Of course, we should be aware of our surroundings. We shouldn't evoke a fake display of emotion. Well, let's ask ourselves this question. Do we show more fervency in our sports teams, in politics, in our bank account, maybe in our job, than we do in our spiritual relationship and in our prayers with our Lord? Don't put on a show for the Lord, but don't hide things from him either. Don't hide your fervent emotion. Christ's prayer was also transparent. Christ was honest about his desires. Of all the subpoints in this message, I think this one sticks out to me the most. Jesus Christ, God himself, Jesus is God, pure and holy and blameless, with full knowledge of the Father's will, and knew exactly what was going to happen in the future, Jesus Christ begged God to take the cup of wrath from him. Verse 39, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. It is not sin to bring your petitions to your Father. Can I say that again? It is not sin to bring your longings and emotions and dreams and unfulfilled desires to your Father. It doesn't demonstrate a lack of faith. If it did, then Christ demonstrated a lack of faith, and that would be blasphemous to say. It was good for Christ to have the desire for his holy deity to not be defiled by sin. That's a good, pure desire. It was a good, godly desire to, for Christ not to want to be separated from the Father and to have the full cup of infinite, eternal wrath poured out on him. Those weren't selfish desires. They were pure, sinless desires. We serve a pure, sinless God. This account illustrates that we can and we do have good desires that are not fulfilled and that we should bring them before our Father in prayer. So not only do we not hide our emotions and our prayers, we don't hide our desires. Bring them to God. Spread them out before your Father. Be like our Lord. Fervently, transparently plead with Him for your good, godly desires. We also see Christ's prayer was ultimately submissive. Verse 39, My Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me yet not as I will, but as you will. There has never been a more submissive action. Jesus, 
who is God himself, submitting his will to the Father. The Creator willingly crushed. The Sovereign willingly slaughtered. The Blameless One willingly counted as blasphemous. The Son of God becoming the Man of Sorrows. I don't think there's a better passage in Scripture that describes this than Isaiah 53. Surely He has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was a chastisement that brought us peace. With His wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to His own way, and the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Verse 10, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush Him. He has put Him to grief. When we become vulnerable in prayer and we bear our souls and our desires and our emotions to our Father, when we fervently, transparently plead with Him for our good, godly desires, we are like Christ. And we are also like Christ when we do that. But we also cry out, but not my will. Though it's a desire, I, I desire so much that it hurts, but yours be done. I plead with you for this but I submit to your will nonetheless. We are like Christ when we pray that way. The fourth point is the battlefield of prayer. The battlefield of prayer. It's the so that in verse 41. Keep watching, praying so that, so that you do not come into temptation. We see in this passage the necessity of prayer. The necessity of prayer. One of the main purposes for our battlefield fellowship with Christ is so that we do not come into temptation. Even during this terrifying time for Christ, he had what was best for his disciples in his mind. That's what he was focused on. He knew it was coming. This garden was about to become the battlefield of the ages. He was in agony, and his disciples were apathetic. They were worn out and tired. They were complacent. They were not on guard. They were ripe for temptation. How about us? Do you feel worn out and tired? Do you feel complacent? Are we unguarded? Are we ripe for temptation? I think we often are. I think I often am. What's the first thing that goes if I've had a busy day and a late night? It's my morning battlefield fellowship with Christ. It's the first thing I forget when I'm busy throughout the day and I'm working through a bunch of things and I have 20 emails to respond to in the passing period is to have battlefield fellowship with Christ. Christ's warning to his disciples was not ill-founded. It is not a coincidence that Christ warned his disciples to pray so they wouldn't fall into temptation and then immediately in the passage they fall into the temptation of denying Christ. It makes me think, am I being called to an intense lifestyle of prayer right now so that, just like our passage says, so that I don't fall into temptation? Are we, as a Beth Eden church family, being called into intense, intense prayer so that we do not fall into temptation? I actually think this is a scriptural truth. We need to embrace this battlefield fellowship with Christ to keep watch with him right now so that we do not fall into temptation. Do we know exactly what that temptation is going to be? No. Did the disciples know exactly what that temptation was going to be? No. Christ didn't say, hey Peter, in about an hour you're going to be tempted to lop someone's ear off with your sword. Hey James, in about an hour and a half you're going to be tempted to run away from this garden because I am going to be arrested and you're going to be afraid. Christ calls his disciples, he calls us to pray in order to be protected. A passage that speaks to protection against temptation, speaking to the armor of God, Ephesians 6, is what it says. Verse 10, Finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. 
Verse 12 warns us, Our struggles not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Do you feel the necessity to pray yet? Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Verses 14 through 17 is a list we're all familiar with of the armor of God. But verse 18 says this about protection from temptation. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. In this very passage about the armor we use to protect us from temptation, we are commanded to pray at all times, keep alert with all perseverance, and make supplication for all the saints. This is why prayer is so important. And Gethsemane demonstrates the vast opposites on the end of the spectrum of prayer and prayerlessness. One author puts it, the story of Gethsemane is as much about the power of prayer as it is about the inevitable failure that comes from prayerlessness. Jesus' faithfulness to do God's task is directly tied to his prayer. The disciples' faithlessness is directly tied to to their prayerlessness. We also see in this passage the struggle of prayer. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Physical fatigue is real. Emotional fatigue is real. Busyness is real. Bandwidth overload is real. The disciples were exhausted, but Christ knew it was vital for them to pray at this time. I think we'd all agree that prayer is important. I think we'd probably agree with the statement that prayer is one way that the Lord accomplishes his purposes, so why don't we do it more? Why don't we carve out time for it each day? Maybe because we don't truly believe that it is important or powerful. Sit still and carve out a chunk of time to just pray? Wouldn't it be better to actually do something? Might I suggest that carving out a chunk of time to pray is carving out a chunk of time to do something. One of the most important things. Christ carved out time in the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And we should too. Why? Because prayer works. I am really against pragmatism, doing something just because it works in the Christian life. But we would be unbiblical if we were not motivated by the power of prayer in our prayers. James 5.16 Therefore, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So pray for victory in a brother's besetting sin. Pray for the salvation of that person you know because it has an effect. If you doubt your salvation, pray. If you're struggling with a besetting sin, pray. If you're agonizing over God's call of suffering for you, plead with him. If you have an unfulfilled desire, bring it to him in prayer. Our circumstances are not meant to distance ourselves from God. They are meant to draw us closer to him. You might say, But if I pray, it's not guaranteed that the answer I want will be God's will. So why pray? Well, you're right. It may not be God's will. But you know what God's will is? That you pray about it. We also see the fight of prayer. The fight of prayer. Because prayer is so important, the devil in our flesh battle fiercely against it. Have you ever found this to be true? finally sit down to pray, and then a million thoughts flood your brain. I should have done this. Oh, I need to do this. I should have done that better. Oh, I need to do that. Uh, Something that's helped me, bring a piece of paper and a pencil, and then just dump those out on the piece of paper, and then get back to praying. I found that to be helpful. We must go into our prayer closets as if we are going to war, because we are going to war. Even this world, recognizes the importance of prayer in the life of believers. I had one of the most amazing things happen to me this past year at the public school where I teach. In the fall semester, some students came up to me 
and they asked if I would be a sponsor for a student-led Bible study before school. And first thing, I picked up my jaw from the floor and replaced it back to my mouth, but then I said, yes, absolutely, I would love to. Let me go check with the administration and see if this is something that we can do. So I talked to the administrators, they said, something you can do, here's some parameters. And so every week on Thursday mornings before school, Bibles were opened in my classroom, donuts were devoured in my classroom, middle schoolers love donuts. And at the end of these uh, Bible study clubs, we would often end in prayer. And um, so my classroom has a big window on the side so you can see into it. In this, this past spring semester, one of those administrators, I respect him very much, he came to me, he said, David, I just want to let you know we've gotten some complaints and I need you to step away from the group during the prayer time at the end of the Bible study club. You can still open the Bible, and still hold that Bible study club in your room. I just need you not to be with the students when there's praying. I was convicted. I was convicted by the people who complained. They understood the importance of prayer in the life of a believer more than I do sometimes. After hearing this passage, if you're like me, you're feeling like, I should pray more. It's important. Christ wants to have battlefield fellowship with me. He wants me to keep watch with him. He's warning me to pray so I don't fall into temptation like the disciples. So, your spirit is willing. But our flesh is weak. Here's the cool thing. God loves to show himself strong in our weaknesses. He loves to do it. He knew the men he chose as disciples would fall asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew that, and he still chose them so that he could demonstrate his strength and their weakness. And he's chosen us for the very same reason. I think a good prayer to keep in our constant use would be simply, Lord, I desire to pray, but my flesh is weak. Help. Can you imagine if one of the disciples had asked that of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane? Four quick application questions as we close this morning. Number one, do we talk more about God than we talk to God? Let's not fall into the trap where theology or knowledge about God becomes a hobby or simply scratches our itching ears Or it's a club that we use to pummel people. Let's let our prayer life exceed our discussions about theology. Prayer is far more important than appearing smart. Number two, do we feel comfortable, fervently, transparently, honestly bearing our souls and desires to our Father? Do we feel comfortable doing that? Are our prayers in a neat segment of our lives? And are they only about things like meals, travel, health? We should pray about meals, travel, and health. But is that all that we pray about? Or have we prayed like Christ and pleaded with God for our longings? Number three, are we ready to do that? To bear our souls to the Lord and submit to His will. Are we willing, are we ready to be that vulnerable? Our fourth Question, what is our go-to in a difficult situation? Christ was facing a difficult situation. What was his go-to? Do we look to a book? Do we look to someone else? Do we look it up online? Or go to a podcast? Or do we, like Christ, make a beeline to the garden so that we can pray? Do we run elsewhere before running to our Father? in prayer. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this gift of the testimony of your word about Christ's last night here on earth before the cross and what he chose to prioritize, how he warned his disciples and he warns us to pray so that we won't fall into temptation. And he models for us that we can fervently bear our souls and our desires to you and we can bring them to you. You long for us to do so. 
ask that we would make that a regular habit, that we wouldn't see prayer as of secondary importance, but that we would prioritize it like Christ did before the cross. We ask, Father, that we at Beth Eden would be a church family that is continually increasing in its praying together. We ask, Father, that that would be our identity. We pray, Father, that as we observe the Lord's Supper, that our minds and hearts would be focused on the cross and we'd be repentant of our sin. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. I am certain that you were praying along with David as he was praying, but um, the, like every phrase of the message ministered to my heart, and I suspect you're probably in the same place. So before we jump into the Lord's Supper, while the men gather for the Lord's Supper, um, Rachel, would you play through uh, when I survey um, one time just slowly, quietly, and that'll give us a few more moments to kind of absorb what we heard and take it back before the Lord. Mm -hmm. 